started the recording. And now let's see if I can share the screen where the slides are. Ta-da! Okay, here we go. Um, somewhere, there we go. This is uh, the front page of the San Luis Obispo Railroad Museum uh, website. Just here to remind you that this is, in fact, a program of the San Luis Obispo Railroad Museum, which I actually assume most of you already know. Um, it's what we're doing to keep in touch, at least to some degree, with people during this COVID uh, thing. The museum is normally uh, open on Saturdays, 10 to 4-ish. Um, but not now, not until all this uh, coronavirus stuff gets out of the way. So watch the website. It has all the updates for uh, anything that is, in fact, um, happening. Today, uh, on our parlor car chat here, we're continuing. As it's part two of uh, a fall color speeder excursion that I took back in 2017, put on by this group. Uh, Motor Car Operators West, which is a West Coast association of speeder owners or motor car owners, uh, primarily for the purpose of getting together and doing excursions on various railroads uh, all over the West, and actually even more than that. Um, this one was in a in the middle of the country in in Colorado. I know they've done them um, much of the United States. They've gone to Alaska. Um, they, they do a lot of uh, excursion trips. So if you're a motor car kind, motor car kind of person, um, this would be a good group to get a hold of. And also, if you end up getting excited about this sort of thing, um, they also have a for sale page on their website uh, uh, with uh, speeders and speeder equipment and accessories and trailers and blah 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 uh, that you can get too if if it's something you want to jump into with both feet. Okay, so um, here's our orientation map. Where in the world are we? If you, uh, the, the red box in the upper right hand corner tells you the area that's covered by the bigger satellite image map uh, to the left of it. And we are going to be uh, on the return trip. We, went, we ended last time uh, going to La Vida going over La Vida Pass and stopping for some fun in the town of La Vida. Well, we're picking up here and we are returning from La Vida through La Vida Pass back to Alamosa, which is on the left hand, in the left hand section of that uh, red circle on the map. This is uh, part of what was referred to as the Creed branch of the ENRGW, the Denver and Rio Grande Western. Um, they had just finished um, getting rail to La Vida or La Vida Pass or somewhere up in that area, and then they put in the line that ran from the pass basically all the way across the valley through Alamosa to South Fork, which is way on the left on this map, and ultimately up into Creed, which is far left on the map. So, but right now, this segment that we're going to be showing pictures from is this section from La Vida back to Alamosa. It's a live railroad. Um, San Luis and Rio Grande operates on these tracks all, all across the San Luis Valley uh, that the area is known as. Um, so here's some tanker cars. I'm not sure if they're in storage or just... Uh, uh, in place, ready to go somewhere, but um, it's it's a live railroad, so you see activity. And there's one of the speeders, if you didn't notice, way back there in the corner, little guy coming around the corner. Pretty rural environment, as you might imagine, out there, farming and and spread out. Here's a couple of horses that we spotted along the way. It it really is 
breathtaking countryside and to be in something as intimate as a motor car is traveling down the rails enjoying the scenery it's it's pretty remarkable um, if you ever get a chance to do it I would highly recommend doing it and fall in Colorado th this was September um, is pretty nice it was pretty cool in fact most people had heavier type jackets on in the morning but by afternoon those were all uh, being changed out for lightweight vests um, it's it's pretty nice environment there's uh, the the I, we the camera is on one side of a big horseshoe kind of curve and there's the other part of the track you can see a little speeder right there um, in the or on the track I, I don't remember this well enough to tell you which way that speeder's going or if he's ahead of us or behind us um, but there he is and there's our guide he is clearly ahead of us so uh, he is moving to the right um, the San Luis and Rio Grande provided us with a guide to make sure we didn't get in any, any trouble or in anybody's way as, as we uh, were taking up their main line from La Vida to Alamosa. Alamosa is where they're basically headquartered. One of the several tunnels, I forget exactly how many, but there are several tunnels on this uh, trip get through some to get over the La Vida Pass. Those are always fun. Uh, you may or may not recall last time as we were going towards La Vida, um, I I mentioned that we passed an amphitheater that was uh, sort of like halfway up the hill to the top of the pass. Uh, this is coming into that amphitheater area at a location known as Fur. Um, and that you can see that brick sort of sidewalk to the left of the track there. Um, that's basically the uh, loading and unloading area for the trains that bring people up to the amphitheater and then take people back to Alamosa from the amphitheater and there's one of our speeders coming in <laughs> you can see there's kind of a semi distressed look on their faces <laughs> they were having some engine trouble um, as, as they were pulling in here it turned out to be quite fixable but um, and there's their motor uh, that's quite the flywheel uh, situation there with with that so they're trying to figure out what was going on There's another uh, open air speeder coming in. One of the uh, enclosed two seaters. Speeders come in all kinds of shapes and sizes open air, closed air, uh, usually minimum of two seats. You can go up to six, um, there, and there's, there are bigger ones too. Um, and, and all kinds of either hard body, some are soft body, some are a combination of a hard frame with uh, cloth drop down sides, that kind of thing. It, there's quite a range of styles of, uh, available of these speeders. Wide open country we're traveling on. There's kind of a shot of most of the group I forget exactly how many cars we had but probably on the order of 20 so maybe you're looking at about half of them out on the plains we're approaching San Luis or not San Luis we're approaching Alamosa in the middle of San Luis Valley um, farm country for sure and out on the plains it's pretty wide open we had a storm that chased us for a while that day but fortunately didn't get I don't think we got wet at all um, but if it, if it was it wasn't wasn't very much again as you may, may recall when we left Alamosa heading up for La Viva during the last session uh, we had to pull off on a siding for a freight train that came through a San Luis and Rio Grande freight train well this is that same area we didn't have to wait for a train today but here we are going through the area where the sidings were and you can see there's lots of uh, either storage or active uh, placed uh, cars 
from the railroad that we're just scooting down the middle of, like it happens every day. Okay, now uh, we're about to head out on a different excursion. Um, the, the next morning, I think it was, um, after getting in the night before into Alamosa from La Vida, we headed out for Central, which in this circle red, uh, the red circle area, here's Alamosa in the kind of the lower right area of the red circle. What we're going to be doing is following Highway 285 up to Monte Vista, where it uh, also is or becomes Highway 160. But at Monte Vista, rather than following on west, which is the Denver and Rio Grande line Creed branch, we're going to get off, well, get, switch over to uh, the, the uh, San Luis Central Railroad, which runs from Monte Vista up 285, up along Highway 285 to a town called Central, which is why it's called San Luis Central. So, um, here we go off on that trip. As is uh, very common, in fact, obligatory, every excursion starts with a safety briefing in the morning. So, probably all the cars are placed on the track behind us, and we've gotten together to hear the any special notes for the day, uh, what are we going to run into uh, in terms of having to get around or get out of the way or move past, um, all that uh, sort of thing. So the morning safety briefing and I, this rabbit attended also, uh, I guess just to make sure he, we didn't get in his way or he didn't get in ours. Um, this is a typical scene um, on a speeder excursion. Anytime we're crossing uh, highways or any kind of road, we generally flag it um, ourselves. The, someone will get out of the front car, uh, get on the uh, road and make sure everything's copacetic for the cars to go across. They go across and then we retrieve our flaggers and, and off we go. It's sort of a uh, let's make sure we do this safely way to approach crossings. And if, we, if you didn't get to see last week, here's uh, just a notion of uh, what traveling with one of these speeders looks like. Typically they're on trailers, and uh, trailers that are designed to have speeders on them, which means they have ramps, the, t the two rails you see here going up and down from the uh, trailer let you roll the speeder down onto the ground, and if you're really lucky, you can line things up so that rail, they roll right onto the track that you're going to. Uh, we're just outside of Alamosa now, he heading west, and uh, you do see a number of industries along the way, obviously served by the San Luis and Rio Grande, um, and lots of farmland. Now we're, I think we've we're in the Monte Vista area uh, where, and have already switched over to the San Luis Central line. This is one of the first pieces of equipment that we came across on their railroad, which I thought was kind of interesting. It's like a little speeder cart, but with quite a little crane operation um, attached to it. I've not seen anything quite like that before. Although I'd seen a lot of carts like that, mainly just with basically nothing on them but a platform for hauling things around. Here's some other equipment that was uh, stationed off to the side of the tracks at the headquarters of the San Luis Central. Um, the guy on the right, I, I forgot his name, I'm sorry, uh, but he's one of the San Luis Central Railroad guys. Um, that railroad, by the way, was founded in 1913 to haul sugar beets. Um, and it was acquired in 1969 by the P. Vine Corporation, which I think still owns it today. Um, and it's basically a 13-mile railroad that runs from Sugar Junction, which is where in Monte Vista the railroad basically starts on the south end and runs up to central Colorado um, at the north end, 13 miles of track. 
Here's uh, probably just some uh, informal chat going on as we gather for the safety briefing with the San Luis Central folks. Uh, quite a bit of old equipment reused and otherwise, or re, uh, yeah, reused, like this old caboose, um, probably a Denver Rio Grande caboose at one point. is now a, a storage room of some sort. There was a lot of that down at the San Luis Central headquarters. There's another caboose, not still on its wheels, you know, not quite as bad a shape as the other one. Obviously, Rio Grande, it's marked that way. As we were heading out of Sugar Junction, there was a work crew um, that had pulled off onto a siding for us to, to go by. Or maybe they were working down, actually working down there. I'm not sure which, but in any case, they were out of our way and, and uh, on by we went north to Central. And this is very typical of what we saw along the line. Um, farm equipment, farm buildings, farm storage sheds, farm elevators, farm, farm, farm. It's all farmland basically from Monta Vista up to Central. Just a straight shot across the plain. Again, very typical of the scenery. And it was all about potatoes. At least what we saw, anyway, was all about potatoes. Potatoes, potatoes, yeah. you want some potatoes. There's one of the San Luis Central guys manning a switch. I'm not sure what was going on there, but um, you can see the at the very right-hand side behind the hopper car is the locomotive. We'll see some better pictures. Um, later, but it's obviously a, a live activity going on there, and we had the, the switch has been thrown to the main so that our group can scoot on by while that tr one car train is in the siding. There, we're coming uh, closer to the San Luis Central locomotive. They have um, they have this locomotive, which is an EMD SW8 uh, number 70. You can almost see that number on the side, the green side of the cab. And they also have one other locomotive, a GE 70 tonner, um, which we didn't get to see or I don't remember seeing and I would have remembered seeing it because GE 70s uh, are what Santa Maria Valley runs in addition to a couple other locomotives. They have two um, 70 ton GE locomotives that, that they use. So that would have really been fun to see that. But if I did, I totally forgot about it and certainly didn't get a picture of it. I think we're coming into the town of Central here. Um, still more potatoes on the right and various kinds of uh, storage slash elevators of some sort on the uh, either side of the tracks as you go on into town. Well, let's see, I have a question here. Uh, let me see if I can get it. Oh, the question is, how bumpy or rough is the ride on a speeder? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, it, the, the, basically, the speeders have no suspension, at least none to speak of. So it will be entirely dependent on the track that you're on, what, what kind of uh, ride you have. Uh, if the track is, is rough, quote unquote, the ride will be rough. Uh, um, if the track is smooth and nice joints and all that sort of thing, then it's it's not too bad. Uh, but it it does it does typically, particularly since usually these excursions are on older tracks, uh, sometimes abandoned tracks, not abandoned in the sense that the railroad let go of the line, but abandoned in the sense that it, that there's no active service anymore on the track, so it isn't maintained as well as it otherwise would be. So it, it can be uh, it can be bumpy. Um, if you didn't catch it last week, um, this is just to show you how we turn these speeders around. Most of them have a uh, turntable, it's referred to, um, underneath in the middle of the car, and when it, it during the ride, that is 
brought up and held snug up underneath the car. Uh, when you stop and need to turn the car around, you uh, flip a switch or turn a crank or do whatever and the turntable comes down, hits the ground and keeps, uh, keeps going. It's, just, it's a hydraulic sort of thing which raises the car up, on, up in the air off the rails so it's only resting on this turntable and then the turntable will swivel. You can spin the car around, pull the turntable back up into the underneath of the car, which lowers the car back onto the rail, and off you go. It's pretty slick. Uh, we talked last time about this large speeder. It's like a six or eight place uh, speeder that was on our trip that time. And uh, it also had a turntable. And this one in additionally carried, he carried this uh, frame, wood frame, uh, for when the base, the, the space between the ties or something about the ground underneath the speeder was irregular, um, they could put that down, pull the car over it, and have the turntable come down on it um, and then turn the car around. And that's a pretty heavy car. Unlike the others where four guys can easily pick it up and turn it around if you don't happen to have a turntable uh, on it or one that's working. Uh, this one would be, that would not be possible. It was, it would be just too heavy. There's a better shot of that uh, San Luis Central locomotive. Yellow and green, interesting enough, remember I mentioned GE 70 tonners, the Santa Maria Valley colors are basically yellow and green. Um, a lot less green on Santa Maria Valley than here, but that's only today, actually, a <laughs> little fun fact. Uh, originally, the Santa Maria Valley's 70 tonners were mostly dark green with uh, yellow lettering and highlights. There's a shot through the train to one of the speeders on the other side. There's sort of a shot of the... Um, the big number three speeder that we were talking about a minute ago and their control panel and through to the San Luis Central equipment. There you can get an idea there. There's that larger speeder, the number three. You can see how much bigger it is than any of the other cars. The other cars are obviously the more typical size. And there's my host, Bill Shirtle. I think I showed you a picture of him last time. We're looks like we're underway now, and he's giving a wave bye to the, the crew that, as we head back down towards Mona Vista. Back out into the countryside. More potatoes. I think that's... Well, I'm not sure if that's potatoes or not. Well, maybe not. Not sure. This is a typical activity, too, um, when you're on a speeder excursion. Um, another flagging opportunity, we, we not only typically flag crossings where we go across roads, um, but we also use flags to let people in the back of, of a, a excursion or behind cars know that the cars, either car or cars in front of them, have stopped. Um, so that you have plenty of distance to, to stop before you would potentially run into a car that has stopped unexpectedly or, or even expectedly. So this is a typical sight. You'll often see red flags pop out of cars showing you, showing you that uh, that car in front of you is, is slowing down and probably stopping or at least be prepared to stop. One of the several rivers we crossed over or creeks on this trip. There's our uh, one of our flaggers again, um, making sure we're clear to go across this road. Okay, now we're going to see, um, I just brought this map up again to remind us where we are. We've, we uh, left Alamosa, we scooted out to Monta Vista at Monta on a Vista, Sugar Junction, we got on the San Luis Central, went up to the town of Central, and now we're back at Monta Vista. 
And I just want to make sure you knew exactly where we are when I show you a few of these pictures of things in Monte Vista. I'm not even sure what these are necessarily. Um, this is obviously a train building or maybe a depot or a station or who knows what um, uh, in Monte Vista. There was, it's an interesting little town in and of itself. I do mean little. And uh, there were some graveyards of sort for various rail cars in a kind of an off area off of Monte Vista. Here's obviously a Pullman looking car. Here's a few uh, freight cars, a uh, piece of equipment. What I, what I was intrigued by was this uh, little rolling office chair that was sitting on the ground outside there. I can, I can just picture somebody sitting there with a cup of coffee enjoying the, the view of some uh, old railroad cars. If you're into railroad history, man, that's what you do, right? Oh, somebody uh, suggested sugar beets in that um, picture. I wasn't sure what the pro product was. I guess that's possible. I don't really know if sugar beets are still a thing out there or not. Um, it, it could have been. Good suggestion. There's another old building in Monte Vista. Should make it a, a haunted house or a, the, somebody's mansion or something. Oh, this was kind of fun. There was a school group um, in Monte Vista, and, and there's the two highway numbers I mentioned, 285 and 160 in the upper left-hand corner there. Um, and they got a huge kick out of seeing these speeders. Uh, I'm not sure maybe any of them ever saw 20 speeders go by on the tracks before. That was kind of fun. Okay, so now we're back at Alamosa, and the next couple of pictures, this is a obviously a welcome sign as you're coming into Alamosa. Um, and I think this, I'm not sure if I'm coming into Alamosa from the north or from the east, but um, either way, one of the, at, at whichever end of town this is, north or east, um, there is a display of uh, a railroad display, a locomotive and a car, which we'll, well, the car we'll see in a minute. Um, this is Denver and Rio Grande Western number 169, um, a 460 if you can't quite see all the uh, wheels on the train. The Denver and Rio Grande had about 12 of these built by Baldwin Locomotive Works in 1883, built as a passenger locomotive, 46 inch drivers. Um, it, that, that's bigger than it looks kind of in this uh, picture. The second largest drivers used on any of the three foot gauge equipment that the DNR GW uh, used. The K37s, which were kind of a infamous or famous DNR GW locomotive, um, had 44 inch drivers. Uh, this particular locomotive was uh, used during its operational life. It was used on all the major DNRGW narrow gauge lines. Um, appears in a couple of famous photographs by Otto Perry uh, on the branch to Santa Fe, New Mexico in 1933. It was taken out of service in 38 and refurbished and sent to the New York World's Fair in 1939. And in 1941, it was returned to the uh, return slash donated to the city of Alamosa, and it's been in this park, Coal Park, C O L E, um, ever since. And there's the other car uh, that's on display along with it. Wasn't quite sure what kind of a car that was. I probably read a sign while I was there, but I don't remember what it said, and I stupidly didn't take a picture of the sign to remind me. Uh, it's a unique, that door's kind of, I'm not sure, maybe a post office car, or, um, ah, I don't know. If anybody has a good idea, hit the chat button. Okay, now we're going to switch um, and head out on a, Another day's excursion. We left Alamosa the next morning 
uh, out and drove out to uh, South Fork, which is out here. Alamos is back here, South Fork here. And now we're going to ride the, t the westernmost end of the Creed branch of the Denver Rio Grande, which was from South Fork to Creed. Um, I'm not sure I mentioned it, the, this Creed branch, the La Vida Pass all the way out to Creed, was built in 1881, at least the first part of it was, which I think got them most of the way, maybe to South Fork. So 1881 is the start time, you might say, for, for this branch. And here we are in South Fork. This is the station master or depot building or uh, whatever for the, the railroad at the South Fork end of, of the line that we're going to cover today. There's some equipment, old Rio Grande equipment, a locomotive. At one time, there were some tourist trains that ran on here, and it wasn't that long ago that they stopped doing it. Like, I'm guessing three to five years ago, uh, maybe maybe a few more years than that, but not terribly long ago, there, were, there, were, there was a tourist train, train running from here up to the Watson White, which is almost a creed. We'll see that a little later on here. There's some of the cars the this railroad had and that cart sitting on the that depot platform. Southern Pacific, there you go, California folks. We, there was a Southern Pacific locomotive there. I guess that makes sense. The Southern Pacific picked up DNRGW before it merged, not too long before it merged with Union Pacific, as I recall. So I guess it would make sense that uh, a Southern Pacific locomotive would, would be out here. One of its older little speeders, obviously a two-seater, open air. Or at least it's open air now. Some of the, some more equipment. Uh, this yellow cart is something of a, a speeder type piece of equipment used to take crews out. Um, I'm not sure if it's powered or not. It does seem to have a, a motor box and maybe some controls, so maybe it was self-powered um, to do line work on the railroad. Here's a good picture of a cart coming off a trailer with those uh, beams or uh, bars that would, are aligned with the gauge of the speeder to set it out. So in this case, it, it wasn't aligned with the track, but you just roll it out onto the track uh, and then use the turntable to turn it 90 degrees and to set it down on the track. Or you could roll it um, kind of depending on what, however you like to do it. The guy on the right uh, was our, our host at uh, South Fork here for the day. I, I, he might be a member of the Dadlin family. Well, no, I'll take that back. That's a different story. Uh, I'm not sure who who or what he is related to. Uh, maybe that tourist train that was there not too long ago. And here we start some scenic pictures along the route from South Fork. We're just out of South Fork now, or, or le just leaving South Fork, heading up towards Creed. Again, beautiful countryside. We went through a lot of cattle gates on uh, more than normal for this, for this whole Colorado trip that we're doing. Not sure why. I guess there's more cattle grazing going on in this stretch than any of the others. You do catch uh, some attention along the way. Um, we, this was fairly early in the morning. If you didn't know that, you could maybe guess it by the coffee cup in her hand. Bridge on the right, river on the left, as we head north through some uh, beautiful country. Sheep farming going on, including a black sheep. Every family has to have one, right? And there's the speeders off to the left as we follow this course of this uh, river. Number of river crossings along the way. I, I get a huge kick out of bridges and trestles and whatnot crossing bodies of water. And here's a pit stop that we took part way up. I'm not sure if there's anything significant about the location, although there might have been. There was a location along the trip that that was something of a small little park. 
you know, maybe parking spaces for 10 or 20 cars and a few picnic tables, that sort of thing. There's some more friends we made on the way. <laughs> People just waving, taking pictures. It's, it's kind of a hoot. More pretty countryside. We do kind of get spread out on the as we're traveling. Um, and we do our best to stick together so we can at least see most of ourselves, never get too much out of touch, but it does get spread out. Look at that. That is just pretty. This is um, uh, most of the way, halfway, a, uh, some amount of distance along the way from South Fork to Creed, uh, an area called Wagon Wheel Gap. And you can see on the side of the building a wagon wheel with a gap. <laughs> kind of a cute logo for the name of the place. Um, the Creed branch of the Denver and Rio Grande made it to this location by 1883. Remember I mentioned that the Creed branch itself was mostly in place by 1881. But the south, from South Fork on up here, it took um, another couple of years to get completed. Um, the 10 miles from Wagon Wheel Gap on to Creed was built by David Moffat um, to serve a mine in Creed called the Holy Moses Mine. What, what a great name. <laughs> um, and this last 10 miles was eventually sold back to the, or sold to the Denver and Rio Grande uh, Railroad in 1892. Moffat built it because the Rio Grande wouldn't. Uh, they didn't see the value of the investment. Um, but they eventually bought it back. I guess they eventually saw the value of, they, the Denver Rio Grande, eventually saw the value of the investment. Uh, they bought it back in 1892, or bought it in 1892. Uh, the last Creed area mine, however, closed in 1985. Um, but revenue trains continued to Creed and, and, and until about 1969. Um, the line actually never made it to Creed all the way, um, about two miles short at the Wasson Y, which we'll see here in a little bit. It was about two miles from Creed, and so ore was loaded, uh, trucked or, or, or buggied or whatever down to the, to the Wasson Y to load onto a train. This is a cool little storage garage for a speeder right along the track where you have a track that comes out perpendicular and then on the left you can see there's the main line um, and a, that circle is sort of your target you might say for the turntable that will come down lift it up turn it 90 degrees set it back down and on the right hand side uh, the front porch of the wagon wheel gap station or depot the, the tracks are on the back side and there we all parked there for a little rest up. It's the Davlin family. Remember, I mistakenly came up with that name a minute ago. The Davlin family is the group that bought this property, including the, the depot, um, some number of years to restore it and did a really nice job. It's a fun little place to be. And we got a, the grand tour of inside and outside. There's the front porch again on the side. Some other close-ups of the of the building. Look at that cliff behind it too. Kind of almost majestic sight that, that this is on. Fall colors out amongst the trees in the hills. And there we're leaving Wagon Wheel Gap to to uh, head on north. The tour included, by the way, the interior of that depot, but um, Mrs. Devlin uh, did, did not permit photos inside, so that's why you didn't get to see any of that. But if you ever are on one of these excursions, you can see the interior, and it's pretty cool um, for yourself. More cattle crossings.
There's a good uh, sort of spread out excursion group across the valley floor there. Some old Rio Grande, Denver and Rio Grande uh, cattle cars it looks like sitting off to the side and they haven't been used in a while. And now we've made it to the Wasson Y. Uh, and it really is a, y, a railroad Y, W-Y-E. Um, in 1956, the last steam train on the Rio Grande ran from Alamosa to Creed and back. So that gives you an idea of when uh, some activity at least came to, uh, came to a halt. Uh, this, uh, and I mentioned that the segment bought by uh, the Rio Grande uh, the Rio Grande Railroad back in 18, late 1800s, very late 1800s. The South Fork to Creed segment was bought again in 1999 by the Denver and Rio Grande Historical Foundation, um, who paid 625k in 1999 for that part of the railroad. Um, they, in turn, sold it to the San Luis and Rio Grande, which was owned by Rail America at the time in 2003. And then in 2005, the SLNRG, the San Luis and Rio Grande, was sold to Iowa Pacific. Um, and I'm not sure where it is now. Remember, we talked a little bit last week, or last time, about the fact that the San Luis and Rio Grande is having some financial trouble. There's bankruptcy stories, uh, articles about them, so I'm not sure what their status is today. But anyway, here we are at the Y. We spent some time out here, some interesting uh, things to note, including this stub switch, which you don't see very often. Um, it's not a switch system like we're used to with the points that go up against the outside rails. This is actually four rails come in to the switch, two of which go one direction, the other two going the other direction from the switch. Um, it was kind of fun. I've never seen one of those, particularly one that was operable. Um, here's another angle of it um, from the other side. You can see you can see there was a little bit of interest in this thing. Um, the it's it's lined to go basically kind of to to the left, and that's not the way to look at it. If you're if you're coming the way that speeder is doing. This is aligned to go on a right divergent track. And uh, if you threw it, this rail would come against the main rail, and this rail would come against the main rail, and the speeder coming into and through the switch would go to its left, uh, leaving the switch. Pretty clever in some senses. Uh, these did not get, tend to get jammed by snow, for instance. But trying to get points up against a rail when, it, when it's covered with snow can be difficult. Uh, that's not a problem in this case. The, the two rails just kind of push the snow out of the way, no, no matter which way it's going. Um, on the other hand, a fair amount of the rail is not firmly attached to anything. It more s slides across. Uh, the the uh, ties, so they're definitely not meant for a uh, high speed. Uh, another disadvantage of them is that if things aren't aligned right when a train goes through it, the likelihood of a derailment is considerably greater than um, a point switch kind of system. Although that can derail too if if you're not lined right. Okay, so let's move on here. Okay, now we're, uh, we've been to the Y, we turned the cars on the Y, we didn't use the turntables, we just turned it on the Y, uh, all of us, and now we're headed back, back towards uh, South Fork. With all those cattle crossings, I don't know how many times we stopped to uh, take the bar barriers down and, and then after we got through, put the barriers back up. Good fishing up there. One of these days I have to learn how to fly fish. I really want to do that. I've never had even a fly fishing pole in my hand. One of the cool little bridges along the way 
And here we are approaching that same bridge, still with the DNRG emblem on it. And here we are actually on it, crossing the river. Cowboy out on the plains. I'm not quite sure what his story is, but looked pretty comfortable to me. Two different shots, one on the left, one on the right. Um, uh, kind of what you see closer to South Fork on this segment. And here's kind of the last shot. Speeder's heading away from us. Sayonara. See you later. Um, on the one of the last cattle crossings of the trip. Okay, that wraps up the fall, the Colorado fall color speeder excursion. The uh, last thing that I want to, or just a little quick thing I want to talk to you about here is Strasburg, Colorado, which uh, is the red pin um, on the map in, in front of you at the moment. Strasburg, Colorado is celebrating this very day, today, August 15th, 2020, the 100th, 150th anniversary of the real transcontinental railroad completion, um, according to them. Here's a plaque. Um, sorry, the picture isn't any better than it is, but I kind of grabbed it from a I've never been out there. Uh, I would have gone out today um, had there been the, the annual celebration that they normally do, and this being the 150th, it would have been a big one, but COVID shut that all down. So uh, I'm just telling you about it. Um, if you want to go out there with me for the 151st next year, let me know. I'll go with you. Um, anyway, uh, August, 8, August 15th, 1870, at Comanche Crossing, which we'll see here in a minute, the Kansas Pacific Railroad drove the last spike on a, on a continuously rail transcontinental railroad. Um, up until that point, eight, August 15th of 1870, the Union Pacific Central Pacific transcontinental line was not continuously rail. Uh, they had no bridge over the Missouri River at that time, uh, at, at the time of 1869 is when they claimed the completion was, but they did not have a bridge across the Missouri River until 1872. Um, up until then, they tried, or they hadn't tried, they, they ferried cars across the river. Uh, they tried to actually cross the river when it was iced over, but that didn't prove to be a particularly smart idea. Whereas on the other hand, the Kansas Pacific Railroad had a rail link across the Missouri River in 1869, a year earlier than this golden spike occurred, in Kansas City is where their bridge crossed it. Um, um, but interestingly enough, Union Pacific gained control of the Kansas Pacific in 1874, which was, wasn't too much later. So either way you look at it, Union Pacific was involved uh, in this, and uh, UP got complete control, ownership of the Kansas Pacific by 1880. Uh, on the website, you can, you will be able to get the link. It's not there now, but it will be soon, as soon as we're done here. Um, there's a nice little brochure, pamphlet, I'm not sure what you call it, uh, that somebody put out, rgusrail.com maybe, about everything you want to know about their uh, celebration anniversary, their story. This is the uh, uh, little railroad building uh, d depot in Strasburg, not far from Comanche Crossing, which we'll see here in a minute, but in this building is the museum, the Kansas City Railroad and Comanche Crossing Museum. Um, and the town of was named, the name Strasburg, uh, was named after or in honor of a Kansas Pacific Railroad official. I don't know what his job was, but um, uh, they renamed the town in his honor that same year, 1870. And here's that 
building from the other side. And here's a sign that's out there, looks pretty old. Um, and somewhere, I'm not for sure if it's on this sign, I think it is, it talks about the, the claim they make of uh, laying 10 and a half miles of track in nine hours to complete this segment on, on August 15th of 1870. I think that might break the record of the 10 mile one day uh, project uh, along the uh, Central Pacific crossing the, uh, to, to, you know, for the 1869 promontory uh, meetup. I'm not sure about that, but um, I thought that, you know, they're basically making a claim at two different things here. And this bridge uh, gets the rail line. That's the active Union Pacific rail line, by the way, the main line that runs from Kansas City to, to Denver. Um, that bridge goes across Comanche Creek. Um, or, yeah, I think it's called Comanche Creek. And I'll, we'll see another angle in a minute. You can see how just humongous that is, I say facetiously. Uh, in the insert in the upper right, there's, a, there's an obelisk that um, at one time anyway marked the location of this golden spike. The exact spot is not marked. Um, you would not know exactly where the, the last spike was, was driven. And I don't even think that monument uh, in the upper right there was in a park uh, in Strasbourg somewhere. And I don't even think it's still there. Uh, at least I, it seems to me I remember reading something that it had disappeared or been moved or, or something. So here's a from the side angle of that bridge across Comanche Creek. You can see it's just a wild water kind of creek. Um, <laughs> so enough said on that, right? Um, there is an interesting other thing to note in Strasbourg. There is the Urich Locomotive Works Company. I, I think they're still in business. At least they were up until just recently. Recently, which, and we'll show you a picture of that. Um, and, and they do. I, I, I read that they've worked on Durango and Silverton trains. They've worked on Georgetown Loop steam locomotives. Um, I, I think it's a relatively going concern, or at least it was until very, very recently. Here's a picture of a steam locomotive. This was just a few weeks ago, July 31st. Uh, this 1903 steam locomotive was leaving Strasbourg leaving the Urich Locomotive Works to go back to or go to Ohio. I don't I don't know where it was going, presumably some railroad museum or something. Um, but anyway, that that's activity involving um, Urich Locomotive Works as recently as uh, a few weeks ago. And in 19 uh, 19 in 2019 um, most of you, I'm sure, recall the big boy taking its swing around the West, uh, ultimately, uh, or as part of that, ending up at the 150th um, at Promontory. Well, not at Promontory, but as close as it could get in Ogden, Utah. Anyway, um, there is a video on YouTube, which, again, I will have a link to on the Parlor Car Chats page, that uh, shows the the 4014 in Strasburg, Colorado last year. And um, not only is the 4014 interesting to look at in that video, obviously, uh, but also in the, in the panning and the, the various scenes that the video captures, uh, you can see a little bit of, a little bit more of Strasburg, the town. So that completes our uh, fall color speeder trip after two sessions and it gets you just a little bit of uh, Strasburg, Colorado, which is only about an hour from our house um, and it's claim to the the real golden spike of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, you notice in the upper left hand corner of my final slide, which is basically always the same, um, there is a request or opportunity uh, for you to uh, donate 
to the museum. As you might imagine, in, in having to shut down and basically entirely, uh, the Railroad Museum has had no income uh, since that happened in March, April, whatever time frame it was, and doesn't foresee any for the rest of the year. So if you uh, appreciate the parlor car chats um, or just the efforts that the uh, museum is still uh, making to make it bigger and better for next year when they do get open, so on and so forth, we'd, we'd really appreciate um, a little monetary support if that, if you can see your way clear to uh, doing that sort of thing. All the parlor car chat information is in uh, is on a web page, the address of which is in the upper right hand corner. There's a feedback survey there um, that we'd love for you to take about the parlor car chats. What topics you want to hear, what do you like, what do you not like, blah, blah, blah. Um, that would help us make the program more valuable to you. And uh, we'll plug the next Parlor Car Chat session, which will be in two weeks on the 29th of August, same, same time, 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, and we'll be talking about the three garden railroads that uh, my dad and I built over the years in uh, California at three different uh, locations. So if you're interested in garden railroads, that was a, uh, that was, tied for the top topic that people wanted to hear from based on that feedback survey um, was Garden Railroad. So we'll, we'll hit that topic next week for those of you who are definitely interested in that. Okay, let me see if I can get the uh, microphones turned back, see if there's any last minute questions or comments from anybody. Well, this is Walt. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Jamie. This was a great show, and given the California heat wave, love the look of those cool mountains in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, boy, that's for sure. I had a, a couple of quick things from my days in uh, Colorado on the San Luis Central. They, they did at one time in the fall have a uh, passenger excursion. I think it was sponsored by some of the Denver clubs like the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club. And uh, they took passengers up and down the line during the time of the fall colors. Unfortunately, I think that has been uh, since been discontinued. But they used some of the equipment in Alamosa and Monta Vista when it was operable. Oh, wow, cool. Yeah, on the KP picture, um, Right now, the KP east of Lyman is out of service and being used for car storage. The, uh, the UP still runs out to Lyman to interchange with the Kyle, which is the old Rock Island coming west from Kansas. But uh, east of Lyman on the KP, they're, they're storing uh, auto racks. And I've seen photos of miles of auto racks occupying their single track main line. Oh my gosh. So. And then one last thing, since you're in uh, the Rocky Mountain State, uh, because of the big wildfire in Glenwood Canyon, uh, the Amtrak California Zephyr is currently detouring between uh, Denver and Salt Lake via the UP, you know, Sherman Hill, Wyoming route. So if you've never had the chance to ride it, you have, uh, they started back on Wednesday when the, when the Glenwood Canyon fire got worse. And uh, so I think through this weekend and possibly beyond, you can ride the UP across Wyoming uh, on a on a Zephyr detour uh, from between Denver and Salt Lake. Oh wow, that that would be fun. We drove along that in order to get out to Ogden last year for the 150th Golden Spike, um, and, and obviously watch the trains the whole trip. That would be fun to do that line. Yeah. You're too late today, but you could, uh, if they're doing it tomorrow, you could still make tomorrow. The, the Zephyr on the detour doesn't leave Denver until the early afternoon and gets to Salt Lake uh, late at night. Cool. Thank you again for the show. Hey, you bet. Thank you. Any other comments, questions before we hang it up here? Okay, seeing none, thanks all for joining us.
We'll see you in two weeks on uh, the 29th. Thank you, Jamie. You bet. Thank you all. Thanks, Jamie.